For the final part of this training, we'll be covering pest management. The three things we'll be highlighting here are first, the pest triangle, secondly, pesticide mixing, loading, and application, and finally, the control of three different pests, weeds, diseases, and insects. So first, let's talk about the pest triangle. The pest triangle, regardless of the pest you're managing, a weed, a disease, an insect has three parts to it. The host, the pest, and the environment, which is a very important or critical part to integrated pest management. Here we see a perfect example of this. The host is perennial ryegrass. It was seeded as a pure stand of grass. Then over time, the fertility became deficient. So the host is perennial ryegrass, the environment is a nutrient deficient soil, and the pest now is white clover, the weed that does very well in low fertility situations. Then if I take a few steps forward, we see another perfect example of this pest triangle here. Again, an area that was seeded as perennial ryegrass, it was nutrient deficient, and now rather than a weed, we see a disease here, red thread, an indication of poor fertility. So here we have two different pests, a weed, which was white clover, and a disease, red thread, which are both indicators or pests that do very well in low fertility environments. So probably the first solution to the problem here is increasing the fertility. Regarding pesticide mixing, loading, and personal protective equipment, remember to always consult the pesticide label. The pesticide label is your reference for all these different things. Uh, mixing, loading, pests that are properly controlled by the pesticide, the proper host that the pesticide can be applied to, and the proper personal protective equipment for the various products that you're applying. So remember, always consult the label. It'll make sure that you're in compliance with Department of Agriculture regulations. In reference to personal protective equipment, always consult the label. Some minimal PPE include things like boots, socks, shoes, long pants, long sleeve shirt, and gloves. To summarize mixing, loading, and application of pesticides, in turf grass management, products are typically applied at one to two gallons of water per thousand feet. This is very important because adequate uniform surface coverage will successfully ensure proper use of your products. To conclude our pest management section, we're now going to focus on the control of broadleaf weeds, more specifically white clover and false dandelion, pathogens being red thread and necrotic ring spot, and finally the control of an insect, European crane fly. So at this point we're going to discuss control of two broadleaf weeds, the first being false dandelion. False dandelion is a perennial broadleaf weed with a deep-rooted taproot system. This taproot system allows the weed to persist well in dry, droughty, summer stress conditions. This weed is typically an indication that you have not been watering your lawn. It's often one of the only weeds or plants that stays green in the unirrigated lawn through the summer. In areas where this weed is not mowed regularly, it produces a large seed stalk and then a bright yellow flower at the end. So broadleaf herbicides that we can use for post-emergent control of weeds like false dandelion, common dandelion, and the thistles are three and four way mixtures containing 2,4-D. 2,4-D is the most important active ingredient for this group of weeds. This product here, Trimet Classic, is the first example. So active ingredients in here are 2,4-D, MCPP, and dicamba.
The next product we're going to cover is Speed Zone, which has these same three active ingredients, as well as Carfentrazone, which is a fourth broadleaf weed herbicide. And the final product we'll look at is Q4. So this four-way herbicide mixture includes 2,4-D, dicamba, as well as quincrolac and sulfentrazone. This is a nice product to include in our list as well because quincrolac will provide very effective control of crabgrass in lawns that have this weed as well. So the next broadleaf weed that we'll cover is white clover. So here I have an example of white clover that's growing in combination with perennial ryegrass. So this broadleaf weed is a good indicator that you're not putting down enough nitrogen on your turf. It is a legume, and like other legumes, soybean for example, it fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere. So it is very often an indicator that you're not putting down adequate amounts of nitrogen. If I set this sample down, and then pick up another sample of white clover here. We can see the stoloniferous growth habit of this weed, which allows it to creep over the surface as it grows perennially. Again, the weed growing with its stolons across the surface. And then if we take a very close look here, we can see some nodules forming on the roots of the white clover where the fixed nitrogen from the atmosphere goes. White clover, however, is often tolerant to 2,4-D, the major active ingredient in products like Trimet Classic, which we discussed earlier. Other weeds that are tolerant to 2,4-D include English Daisy, Black Medic, as well as wild violet. So for control of this group of weeds, we're gonna look for products with triclopyr. An example of such a product here is T-Zone. T-Zone has triclopyr as the first active ingredient, as well as sulfentrazone, and the ingredients 2,4-D and dicamba. To summarize our weed control section, if you apply a herbicide to take white clover out of your existing stand of grass and you don't change your fertility, mowing, or irrigation practices, you can expect the white clover to return to those areas. Remember, after herbicide applications are made, you need to get the proper primary cultural practices, mowing fertilization, into effect or weeds will only return to the areas where they previously existed. At this point in pest management, we're going to cover the control of two different pathogens, red thread and necrotic ring spot. First is red thread. So red thread is a disease that's very damaging to perennial ryegrass in low fertility situations. Typically when we find this disease, it's an indicator that we're not achieving our recommended rate of nitrogen per year, which was three to five pounds annually. And it gets the name red thread because of the mycelium, which gives it this red appearance. The pathogen spreads across the surface of the leaves, and when it dries out in the sun, it provides this pinkish, reddish, hard mycelium on the surface of the leaves. So typically, control of this pathogen can be easily provided by adequate fertilization. And remember, that's three to five pounds of nitrogen applied four times, twice in the spring, twice in the fall. And this disease also can be controlled in high priority situations, high value situations when the fertilizer has not been effective with a broad number of contact or systemic fungicides. The second pathogen that we'll cover today is necrotic ring spot. Necrotic ring spot is very specific to Kentucky bluegrass. The reason being, Kentucky bluegrass is a rhizominous grass spreading laterally underground. 
These rhizomes develop organic matter over time. As organic matter increases, the root-borne pathogen necrotic ring spot will be, become worse and worse because the pathogen not only fall, feeds on the turf but also on the organic matter that accumulates in the soil profile. This pathogen has a very interesting life cycle. Initial infections typically begin in the fall months and the spring months when the environmental conditions are wet and cool. However, symptoms are not visible this time of year. It is very good growing conditions for grass like Kentucky bluegrass, the cool wet weather. So as the pathogen infects the turf, we often do not see the symptoms until we enter into the summer period when heat and drought affect, decrease the health of the turf. The pathogen is not very active this time of year. However, the grass, because the root system has been compromised by the pathogen, succumbs to the summer heat and drought stress. This is very important because when we consider fungicide applications, a fungicide application, when the symptoms are present during the summer, will not control the pathogen because the pathogen infected the turf back in the previous fall and spring months. We need to make preventative applications in the spring and the fall before the symptoms are present. Symptoms of this pathogen initiate as small, necrotic, brown or yellow patches that grow larger and larger. As these patches get larger to about an 8 inch in diameter, grass will often recover in the center of these patches. You then have a necrotic circle or ring with grass outside the ring and grass inside the ring. We often commonly refer to this symptom as the frog eye, which is very typical of necrotic ring spot. In terms of control of necrotic ring spot, we're going to use cultivation and fungicides. Remember, this disease is specific to Kentucky bluegrass, which has the aggressive rhizominous underground growth, which accumulates organic matter. The pathogen feeds on the organic matter as well as the grass. So reducing organic matter through frequent core cultivation is very important. Cultivating twice a year can substantially reduce your necrotic ring spot infection and activity. In terms of fungicides, the two major active ingredients that are going to be effective on this pathogen include DMI fungicides such as propiconazole, which has the common name Banner Max, as well as azoxystrobin, known as Heritage. Another product that is very effective on this pathogen is headway, which is a mixture of the active ingredients propiconazole and azoxystrobin. And again, remember these applications need to may, be made preventatively in the spring or fall months rather than in the summer months when the, pre, the symptoms are present. Management of European crane fly will be the last pest that we discuss. This insect is a diptera or member of the fly family which also inclu includes common crane fly. It is easily identified by the long thin legs and the large membranous net vein wings that are held out against the body when the insect is at rest. Turf grass areas adjacent to wetlands are very particular to crane fly habitat. These insects prefer very moist wet soils when finding areas to lay their, lay their eggs. So typically grass that is adjacent or next to ponds, lakes, various wetlands, low-lying areas that drain water, or areas that are over-irrigated or shady are very typical of crane fly habitat. So things that we can do to dry out the soil surface will reduce crane fly infestations. A general recommendation is if you have a history of crane fly infestations, Turn your irrigation system off on Labor Day. This will decrease the crane fly populations and it will not be very detrimental to the turf because during this time of year heat is reducing and the seasonal rains typically are coming in to the fall season so environmental stresses are not as a concern for turf grass. So adult European crane fly 
emer emerge from the soil in mid-August to October. They quickly find a mate, reproduce, and then lay eggs. The eggs take about a two-week two week period to hatch. The larvae then go through several instar, beginning in the fall, through the winter, into the summer months. During these instars, we should be doing our scouting in December and January, about the third instar stage. This is when the larvae are the most active and will often find the highest concentration of larva. For scouting, we can use a square end shovel like this. We're gonna make a square hole down to about a three inch depth in the soil and then flip over that piece of soil. We're looking for concentrations of 20 to 50 larvae per square feet. The number of larvae that determine our action threshold is going to be ten dependent on the successful mowing, fertilization, and irrigation. If we're not doing these cultural practices successfully, we'll have a lower action threshold, closer to 20 larvae per square foot, where we start to see thinning turf. If the, if the cultural practices are maintained at adequate levels, regular mowing, regular fertilization in the spring and the fall, and adequate fertilization in the summer will have higher action thresholds of 50 larvae per square feet or even greater before we start to see thinning turf. The larvae will complete their life cycles in the late spring, early summer months, go into pupation in July and then emerge again as adults in mid-August. For control of these insects, when we've reached an action threshold of 20 to 50 or even more larvae, depending on our cultural practices, we have a number of different active ingredients that are effective on early and then late instar stages. Products effective on early instar periods of this insect, which again would be the early winter months, include imidacloprid, which is also known as the product merit. There is some danger associated with this product in relation to bees. It has been known to kill bees and does kill bees. However, when we apply it to a turf grass situation, the risk is very low because turf is not a flowering plant. Mm -hmm.